Hey everybody, you made it. Thanks so much for joining us for this video tour of the Masumi Sake Brewery. It's a wonderful day. It's a perfect day to kind of take you through all the steps of sake making together. Um, first thing I want to really talk to you about is our history and where we and who we are because it's really important. Now, this is the Masumi Sake brand. The brand is, as you can see, right up there. This is our main brand, but the name of the company is not Masumi. The name of the company is the name of the family. This is an old family called the Miyasaka family, and they've been making Masumi brand sake since 1662. Very long time indeed. Now, where are we is who we are as a sake maker. Basically, we're in Nagano Prefecture. Nagano is full of mountains. You might remember 1998 Winter Olympic Games in Nagano. So as you can see behind me, fantastic mountains, a beautiful alpine environment. The Miyasaka family started making sake down in the town of Suwa, which is right down over there in the valley. And from that point, they've always made sake in that same place. Today, we're going to take a tour of the Fujimi Brewery, which is up here higher in the mountains. This is a brewery started in 1980. It's got more land and more opportunity to make really cold weather sake. Up here, it's 1,000 meters. 1,000 meters is about 3,300 feet, so it's a very high elevation. Little look around here. You notice there in the trees you have a Shinto shrine. Sake and Shinto religion are connected at the hip. They're very important parts of Japanese culture. So now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the first step in sake brewing, which is polishing. So why don't you follow me? We're going to take a little walk. We have to go to the back of this brewery building to get to the polishing plant. As we do that, you might notice there's a train. What's the train? Everybody asks. This is Grandpa's train. He's the guy who made this brewery here in 1980. And he loved trains. And so his friends in the Japan Rail Service actually gave him a train set to set up here. Now, as we move this way, you can kind of get an idea. It's a pretty big place. So we're going to walk down to the edge, and that's where we'll see the polishing plant. So just follow me. Okay, so rice polishing is the first step for us. Uh, that means we do not actually grow our own rice. We buy that from farmers or from the farm cooperative here in Nagano. And then once that rice comes in, we start. So we're right in front of the polishing plant. So the rice comes in on really big trucks, comes in here, and then we offload it, use a forklift, the rice comes in these really big bags. They're usually 1 to 1.5 tons of brown rice in each bag. Once it's off the truck, we use a winch system here to bring that rice over and bring it into the polishing plant. So we winch it across. And then right here, this is a hopper, basically. So once the bag is hanging up here, we untie the string at the bottom. And down she goes. It's basically just a net down there and it catches the rice and takes it inside. So let's take a look inside the rice polishing plant. While we do that, I should point out, when I say rice, I mean Nagano rice. We want to be as local as possible. So about 95% of what we make, we make with Nagano uh, specialized sake rice. If we go inside here, we can see where the polishing actually happens. So wow, it's really bad out there. Here we are, this is the polishing plant. As we get in here, you can see this is a really big operation. Now we're one of the few sake makers in Nagano that has its own polishing operation because as you can see, it's very large and very involved. Now you saw outside the brown rice comes in, comes in under the floor here, and then we convey it up to these big tanks on this side of the room. Basically. This side of the room is for cleaning off that brown rice. Not for polishing, but for cleaning. We want to take away anything metal that might have fallen into the brown rice because metal will destroy the polishing units. So first we clean and then we move the rice across to this side. This is the polishing side. This is where the real action happens. So let's take a look at the polishers. It's quite deep. We have actually eight polishing machines. Watch your head. Let's go take a look at it. Oh, wow. So these are 
Our main polishing machines, again, we have eight of these puppies. They're always working. Whenever we're doing polishing, they run 24 hours a day. I want to show you how they work, so we'll go take a look at one of these up close. Watch your step. So basically, above me here, this is our main polisher. You see the big gray tanks, that's where the brown rice goes in. And then naturally with gravity, the rice flows down and goes into those green housings. In those green housings is a polishing stone spinning very quickly. Actually, if you look down here, this is the polishing stone that's inside of those green housings. So those spin around very quickly inside of those housings. The rice goes through there quickly to the bottom and then we move it back to the top. It's a cycle. It keeps going up to the top and back through the polishing. Depending on how much you polish, it could be 40 hours or 50 hours or more continuously to get the final polish. Let's take a look at some samples. There you go. For example, this is before, this is after. So you're talking about brown rice goes in. And then this one, for example, is 35%, which is 35% remaining of the rice. We have taken away much more than half of the rice in this one. That's a lot of rice, a lot of polishing. The reason we do this is super important, so I want to explain that. It's a little complicated. The reason we polish so much is because we want to take a good balance. The outside, its color partly comes from protein. It has lots more protein. Protein is also important for the flavor of the sake, but too much protein can mean a bad balanced sake. We're trying to bring the protein side, which becomes amino acids and savory notes, into balance with the starch side, which is going to become sugar and alcohol. It's sort of like a band. You need a bass player and you need drums. That's the protein side, but they're usually too loud. So you want to tone down on the savory notes and the acidity in order to get better balance with the alcohol and the sugar. Also, we do generate a lot of flour, obviously. This is our rice flour, and don't worry, we use all of it. We sell it to brokers or we use it for our own pickling and so on, so it never gets wasted. Okay, so after doing all that polishing, the next step is to do washing. Now, it's pretty obvious why we have to wash. You still have all of that rice powder, which has lots of protein in it, and you have to take that rice powder off of the rice, so washing is super important. But the next step after washing is even more important. That's um, soaking. In other words, you want to soak the rice in water to give it more moisture. Now, as anybody who has ever made a pot of rice and messed it up, you know if you don't do it right, it's really not right. So washing and soaking, really important points. Now, before, about 10 years ago, to do the soaking perfectly, we had to do it by hand. And it took so many, it took everybody in the brewery all hands on deck. We used to wash the rice in this little rice washer right here. And then we dump the rice out into basically a strainer. See that? And then get our stopwatch and go. And put in here and then very carefully soak it down to the second to make sure that rice is soaked perfectly. Oh, I better take it out. Ugh. Now this was a lot of work. We could only do this with our super premium Daigindro stuff because it took all hands on deck. These days, however, we're so lucky, we have this lovely robot that does both washing and soaking and it only requires the effort of one operator. So what you've got here basically, small lots, and that's the key. By washing and soaking in small lots, you're able to improve consistency and quality overall. And with this wonderful system, all of the sake we make here, everything from table sake up to the super premium stuff, we can do in small lots. There it goes, it's starting to move now. After you're done with the soaking, We basically get to move the soaked rice by conveyor into these boxes.
the key to these boxes is wheels. Because the boxes have wheels, when it's ready and full, we basically wheel the box over here to the elevator. That's our rice elevator, it goes in there and it goes up to the second floor. That's where we do all of the rest of the brewing processes. So we need to go up there too to do that. We're gonna suit up in our whites. So follow me, let's go upstairs. Okay, so now we're changing the whites. We're ready to be inside the brewery. Now, this is the rice elevator you saw downstairs. Now we're on the second floor, so this is upstairs. We're ready to go see the steaming area. So follow me. Remember, there are lots of boxes with rice, so we take the boxes with rice and we wheel them over to the steamer. Just imagine, we got our box of rice, away we go. And we bring it into the steamer area here. What happens is, basically, we take the rice out of the box, and we move it over here. Want a stick of the steamer? So the rice gets moved with the winch to the steamers. We have two steamers, and then the rice gets lowered in the steamer. The cool thing about these steamers is you can do several layers of rice in one steamer at one time. This steamer has just been finished, so we opened it up and we're taking one layer out at a time and moving it over here. This is the cooler. So after we steam the rice, that's about an hour of steaming, we move it over here to the cooler and we cool it down. Let's take a look. Hi there. Domo, chotto dake okome chodai. Arigato gohan. Onigiri. Tariru, tariru. Okay, so this is what we're aiming for right here. For doing good steamed rice for sake making, you want to make it kind of reverse al dente. In pasta, al dente is inside is firm and the outside is soft. For this, it's the opposite. The inside is soft and the outside is firm. That's what we're aiming for. So this is the kind of uh, consistency you want. Have a little taste. Mmm. Actually, it's a little chewy, but it definitely has firmness. This is perfect for the next steps of making the sake. So let's go take a look at that. On the other side of the cooler, away we go. Now we're waiting now for the rice to come out. As you can see, the rice is going to be coming out of the cooler here. It's going to come on the sheets and these burring workers are going to be taking those sheets into the box again. This particular batch of rice is going to be used to make koji. That's the kind of mold that helps us convert the starch to sugar. You can see on the top of the machine, there's a little machine on top there. That is actually spreading the koji spores from there onto the rice. So we're already putting koji on the rice right here. Once the koji goes on, it gets in these sheets and these guys are going to move it over to the box. They'll do that until they get a full box and then we move to the koji making area. Okay, so we were watching that rice coming out and again I mentioned this is going to the koji room where we're going to make the koji mold. They're almost ready to get that first box of rice going to the koji room ready. I think we've got maybe one more sheet and then we're going to move with them over to the koji room. And these guys, when the rice comes out, you can't stop. You just have to keep moving the entire time until all that steam rice comes through the cooler. And one thing about this is you have to be careful with the temperature, so you don't want to leave the box too long. But basically, as soon as they get that last load of rice in there, they're going to want to move that soon in order to make sure the temperature doesn't go down too much. The next step for koji making, temperature becomes really important. 
Away we go. So we follow the guys over to the Koji room. They cleverly set that box up on a kind of tray that allows it to roll straight into the Koji room and out she goes. All right, now, just keep going. You can see from here, what they're doing in there basically is very special. That's why we have it sealed off. Again, koji is a mold. It's called Aspergillus orize. And this mold has the power to break the starch down to sugar. You need sugar in order to make alcohol. So what's happening in here is that first step. We're breaking starch to sugar. Then when that koji is finished, after about two days, we'll be ready to start making alcohol. Now, a thing about koji is it also makes some wonderful other enzymes that break down the protein. Remember I mentioned protein. That protein gets broken down into amino acids. We want to have that because it creates umami. It creates a savory character of sake. So both the starch going to sugar and this protein is going to umami is part of the koji process. Inside the room, now let's have a look here. This is the koji itself. So it comes in a kind of powdery form, and then we just basically sprinkle that powder. After that, we give it two days, and it's ready to come out. If we're gonna make a lot of koji, we do it in this big room. If we're gonna make a little koji, then we use these small wooden trays. They're called koji buta. So we'll make a small amount. That's when we're making the daiginjo premium stuff or specialized koji. We'll use the smaller amounts. When the koji comes out, basically it looks like this. Look at that. So we bring it outside and it's ready. And I taste a little bit of it. Isn't that nice? Look at that. You'll notice that the koji sticks together because it creates little filaments, almost like a silk cocoon. I'm going to try a little taste of that. It tastes soft and nutty and beautiful. It's perfect for the next step. Okay, let's go. After you've got your koji ready to start alcohol fermentation, and that's going to start right over here. This room is kind of the center of the whole brewery. I wanted to show you these characters, if you can see that. This is the character for sake. We say shu. This is the character for mother. So this is the mother of the sake's room. This is where we start fermentation. Let's go take a look. You're really lucky. Right now, they're just beginning to start a new fermentation tank. Now, we call this the shubo, the yeast and the sake's mother. So in English, we call this a yeast starter. So they're just now adding the steamed rice into this new yeast starter tank. Basically, what's going to happen in here? Once you finish that steam rice, it's ready to go. And you basically allow the yeast to work in here for 10 days. After 10 days, the yeast starter is ready and we can move on and grow the mash. What we want to do is take this small amount, move it to a bigger tank and then a bigger tank and grow the mash. Now, what happens in this tank, first you put in the koji rice and the water, then you prepare that, make sure that the enzymes are beginning to break the starch to sugar. Then you add the yeast. After you add the yeast, then you're ready to add the steam rice. You're ready to go. Let's take a look. So this is brand new. Brand new one. Just starting out. Let's find one that's just starting out. Oh yeah. This one was started yesterday. So you can see in there pretty well. The rice is beginning to melt a little bit. It's becoming a little bit more like rice porridge. 
Let's find one that's really moved along quite a bit. Yeah, maybe over here. Yeah, sixth day, pretty good day. Let's have a look at that. Take a look at that down there. Isn't that amazing? The aromas are beautiful, lots of fruit. Most of these tanks are using our own number seven yeast developed by Masumi. So you're gonna find beautiful aromas of both apple and pear, but a lot of banana, especially banana. So this is where all of this yeast action begins. The point to make this is not to make alcohol. The point of the starter is to make more yeast, to get a really robust yeast culture going. From there, you can move on to grow the mash in what we call the moromi. So we shikomu, we add more rice, more koji rice and more water and slowly grow that. That's the next step. Let's go over there and have a look. <sighs> okay, so done with the yeast starter, I can take this mask off. As I mentioned, from the yeast starter, we want to build the mash. So follow me, we'll go to the main mash room. Now the main mash room is where we start growing a bigger and bigger mash volume. It's also where fermentation is going to really take off. So because it's so important, we always have the god shelf above the mash room. This is called the kamidana, it's a god shelf. There's a god of sake, it's called Matsuo Kami. And so we have a little shrine to the Matsuo Kami right there. We always make sure that he gets enough sake or she or both. Uh, so that everything works well for our fermentation. If you come inside the mash room, you'll find that there are no tanks, except those little ones in the corner. That's because those big mash tanks are actually built into the floor. So we're standing on the top of the tanks. Let's go to the next stage over here. The reason we do it this way is we don't want to shock the yeast by making the temperature change too much too quickly. So we want to grow this mash slowly and gently so we don't make the yeast too stressed. The first stage after the yeast is actually to move to a tank this size right here. So we move the yeast starter into a tank like this. Then we add the basic ingredients, koji rice, regular steamed rice, and water. Then we give it three days to ferment in this smaller tank. After three days, you're ready for the second addition, and this happens like this. You take this tank, and if you look here, you have a valve. You open the valve, all of that goes down into this big tank. And then, in the big tank, we add two more times. Water, steamed rice, koji rice. Then the next day, again, water, steam rice, koji rice. Then you're done, you've got the full mash. Uh, let's take a look at one of the full mash tanks. It's been going for about two weeks now, so it's beginning to really ferment well. It's right over here. So as you, we'll show you a little close up here. So down in here, you've got this fermentation going. Now it's been about two weeks. You're gonna see a lot of bubble action because the, obviously the yeast are fermenting and making CO2 bubbles. So you're gonna be bubbling along in there. Uh, you get great aromas, but you have to be careful because this is CO2, it's not oxygen. If I get my face in there too far, I fall asleep and fall in the mash. You don't want that. So there you go, that's what's going to be happening now for about 30 days. Most of our fermentations in, this, uh, in these big mash volumes are about 30 days. Now after that long 30 day period, we want to go down and be ready for filtering. Let's take a look downstairs. It's a bit tricky. Watch your step in here. Watch your head too. Watch your feet.
So we're going to go ahead and look downstairs and take a look at these mashed things from down there. Okay, so now we're basically moved down from the second floor to the first again. And what I want you to show are the same tanks that we saw from up there. We'll just look at them from down here. Uh, we have a lot of them, obviously. It depends on how much we're doing. But right now, we're sitting at about uh, 30 tanks. And as I mentioned, the fermentation is quite long. It's about 30 days, 32 days. During that time, the most important thing we're doing is controlling temperature. We don't want the yeast to produce too much heat and raise the temperature of the mash. So we use these temperature control systems here. So we put jackets basically on all of these tanks. And then we run very, very cold liquid through the jackets in order to keep those tanks super cold. And that allows us to really extend the fermentation. That gives us a better result, more uh, aroma, and a better balance overall. OK, let's just move on. Okay, so after fermentation is completely finished, it's time to filter or to press, so let's go over to the pressing room. Now, I mentioned pressing. This is because we do want to put a little pressure as well as filtering at the same time. We have a lot of mash to filter, so we're going to have to have a pretty big filter system. We call it a panel filter. These are actually some of the panels that are used in the filter. You can see you have big panels, and on top you have filter cloth and this mash is run through the filter cloth. Let's take a look inside. So those panels are set up into this filtering array. And I'll take a look inside of this right here. This is where it happens. Now, all of the panel makers in Japan are really one maker. It's called Yabuta, and that's this guy. So everybody here in Japan, when we talk about going to the Yabuta, that's what we're talking about, because this maker has monopolized the market for these panel filters. Now, I want to show you just a little bit how this panel filter thing works. Most people, the first time they see this, they see this big plunger here, and they think that we're pushing the sake from the back. We're not. What we're doing, actually, if you come in real close and look up there, actually, those air hoses are delivering compressed air. Those small hoses are delivering compressed air to each of these panels. So we're actually bringing air inside the panel and pressuring it from the inside out. So it's kind of a cool system. Now, when you give that pressure, the sake runs out through the filter cloth and into the waiting tank. You're so lucky today. We've actually got some sake in here. So let's give it a little taste. It's just come off the filter. So I'm sure it's super good. Righty, get my Masumi cup here. All right, here we go, got that? <laughs> Let's have a look. Oh yeah. I have a feeling that's gonna be pretty nice. I'll park that right there for a minute. So we're gonna give this a little look. Wow, the aromas are really intense. The aromas at this point are probably as high as they're gonna be. Super fruity, and that's because it's just been filtered. I'll take a little taste. Mm. Wow, vibrant and punchy. This sake, again, because it's just coming out of the filter, it has not been adjusted for alcohol content. Normally we adjust, bring it down to 15% or so, that's typical. This is not adjusted yet, so it's about 17% alcohol, so it's super punchy and super rich. It's great stuff. Now, I hope someday you can come and join us in the real time, and we can enjoy this together. Fantastic stuff. Guys, you're so lucky. Today we happen to be doing a special filtering of our competition level Jumai Dai Ginjo. It's called Yume Dono. We do that differently. The way we filter is very delicate. What they're doing now is they're taking the mash and they're putting it into small sake bags inside of a tank. And then they let the bags drip out the sake very slowly. And they're just setting up the bags now. You can see down below is where the sake is coming out. And they've just finished putting the mash into those bags. They're going to let those bags drip all day long. 
And again, that's going to become a top-level Jumai Daiginjo called Yume Dono. It'll also be the sake that we enter for competition in Japan. Everybody, thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Wonderful stuff. Want to take a look? Now I should mention that after we filter, there's many other post-processing options that we have. One option again is to add water to lower the alcohol, but we don't have to do that. We can also micro-filter to clarify it a little bit, uh, but we don't have to do that either. Another option is to pasteurize it in order to stabilize it. We don't have to do that. We can leave it as fresh as it is now. And then another option is to mature it or age it in storage. We can do that, or we don't have to. It depends on the style of sake we're working on. Now, if we do want to age it, I want to show you how that happens. So let's go to the storage area. Here we go. Follow me. Right, now let's take a look at the storage area. Just follow me this way. Now, as we move in here, I want to do point out that we don't always do big storage. It depends on the style of sake. Let's take a look at the stuff that we're storing for maturation. Here we go. Kind of big, huh? <laughs> I should mention this entire space is a big refrigerator, so we keep everything really cool in here no matter what uh, time of the year it is. And we have a lot, as you can see, storage tanks. These are about 20,000 liters for each tank. And again, the main thing that we're trying to do here is let the sake settle down a little and literally settle. So there's still going to be some rice sediment in the sake, so we're going to let that settle in the tank. And then normally in these tanks, we're going to pull that sediment out. We might do microfiltering at that point, or we might save that for a bit later. Another thing we're going to want to do in this area, um, it's refrigerated, so we don't have to do any pasteurizing right now. But after a little while, we're going to do some pasteurizing of some of the sake. Now what that does is it stabilizes the sake. It stops the enzymes that are converting that starch to sugar, so it stops that. It also makes sure that none of the bacteria that make lactic acid can get into the sake. So pasteurizing is something we might do in this large scale. I should mention as well that depending on what we're doing with the sake, we might want to leave it in these tanks for six months, maybe eight months, maybe a whole year. Depends on the style of sake. A lot of times what we're doing is across brewing years. For example, this is our current brewing year. Next year we start our brewing in October, as I mentioned. So we might want to actually have some sake stored and then blend across the years. And even these tanks are not big enough for that. So let's take a look at the blending tanks over here. Follow me. Open that up. So yeah, I know, pretty huge, huh? So this is the blending area, and these tanks, as you can see, are way bigger. Actually, one of these tanks is about 60,000 liters, uh, and we have a whole lot of them. So we can take one of these tanks, and then we can blend in two or even three of the tanks you saw out there and we blend just the right amount of the years before sake with this year's sake in order to make consistency across the product line. Some of our products are available all year long and so we want to make sure that the flavor and the maturity level is consistent. So these blending tanks allow us to do that. Um, they're so big it's hard to see them from here. Let's take a look upstairs and that will give you a better perspective. Follow me. We're going to just do a little bit of climbing now. Up we go. A 
Phew. A little bit out of breath doing this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so a little bit scary. I hope you're not afraid of heights uh, like me. <laughs> this is a, woo, get the chills up here. So this gives you an idea of just how much volume we have for blending. And again, a little bit of storage as well. But I should mention that uh, the amount of sake that we make today is very different than we made at the peak. The peak was late 70s, early 1980s. Back then we were making around 3.5 million liters a year. But things have changed. Back then it was mostly standard level table sake. And these days it's mostly for us premium sake, Junmai's up to Daiginjo's. So the volume that we make is much smaller. Also this last year with the pandemic has also reduced our production volume. This year we're gonna make about what we call 6,000 koku and that's about 1.3 million liters. Still a lot, but nowhere near the peak. Let's take a look at this tank. Oh boy, <laughs> that's scary. Yeah, that's a lot of sake down there. Uh, take a look. So we continue to mature, blend, do our pasteurizing, getting our products ready for you. And uh, now basically that's all there is to say. We're gonna go out, take a look at our products, and then we'll see you hopefully here someday in the real time. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, we're back where we started. Just came down off of that tall storage tank area. And this pretty much concludes our tour of the brewery. But I did want to end by pointing out that these become really beautiful finished products. Uh, we have different styles, and I know you'll find some of them in your market as well. Uh, and I wanted to introduce you to this new set. We're an old company, but we always start with new ideas. So this is our new flagship set of sakes. You've got Aka, you've got your Kuro, you've got your Shiro, and you have your Kaya. And these are part of the new lineup. So please look for these in your market. And this time it was video, but I hope that very soon we'll be able to meet for real. So please join us up in the mountains. I look forward to cracking a bottle with you, enjoying, maybe do some kampai. And thanks again for coming. So see ya and sayonara.